Hello everybody and welcome to this, the 40th episode of Pottywood, the podcast where we talk about movies with the people who make movies, but I'm just that excited because we just realised that this is going to be the 40th episode. Hell of a, a milestone, and to help me celebrate that milestone, as always, is my co-host, Andrew Roger Carson. I, I am just absolutely buzzing because, uh, well it's not because of the caffeine that I'm on, but it's also because I went to see The Batman the other night. And my faith in movies has been restored in just one movie alone. Was it good? Absolutely amazing. Oh, 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 amazing. Amazing. Better than sex in some circles, I will say. Okay. Right, I have not yet to see this movie. Um, so avoiding spoilers, obviously. Um, but how honestly is it as a film? How is Robert Patterson? Because that's what people want to know more than anything else. How is the guy from Twilight doing in the Bruce Wayne outfit? I am going to hold my hands up here, okay? When the casting of Robert Pattinson was first announced, I was like, ugh, really? Really? Uh, failing to realise that that has happened to pretty much every single Batman we have ever had. Uh, bar Val Kilmer, which is a, ugh, really? Mm. Um he is amazing. I, I'm. I've got to hold my hands up here. It is the best portrayal of Batman I think I have ever seen on screen. Really? And you know he deserves. Price. He deserves every single bit of credit in the world. Uh, and when you see this movie yourself, and I advise you, please go and see this on the big screen. Do not wait for it to come out. Don't watch it on your phone. Don't watch it on the TV. Go and witness the splendor of this three-hour movie on the big screen as soon as you can. It deserves that platform. Oh, I was yeah. going to say, does it deserve that three-hour runtime? Does it work in justice of it, or is it a bit of a detriment? What's going on? No, it deserves it. Okay. I, I came out of those three hours wanting another hour, right? You know, it's like uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League. You're like, is this still going? Mm -hmm. This feels like this could have wrapped up an hour ago. With this thing... You are so engaged. Colin Farrell as the Penguin, freaking amazing. Right? Paul Dano as the Riddler, out of this world, amazing. The other little cameo you get at the end, absolutely amazing. Everything in this movie is beautiful. Just perfect. There is no fault in this movie whatsoever. I, I've never walked out of something just like, holy shit, I've just felt like my love and appreciation of film has just been given something brand new. I have never seen Batman. I put it above The Dark Knight. Well, are you definitely sure about that? I am definitely sure about that. Maybe. <laughs> now there we go! <laughs> I got there. I got there. I, I didn't see it initially, but I just saved it. Definitely maybe. Yes, yes. definitely maybe. That was uh, What's in the Box from last week. Yes, it was. Okay. Uh, the Ryan Reynolds 2008 uh, rom-com. Uh, which has got a pretty decent cast, um, not not as good a cast as as apparently the Batman has, uh, but you've got Rachel Weisz, um, Kevin Klein, Elizabeth Banks, Isla Fisher, um, and it's a story about a guy who's uh, going through a divorce and he's trying to explain how he met. Wait, where have I heard this story before? This would. Yes, it's How I Met Your I Mother, the nothing. movie. <laughs> I, You know what? I was watching it. I was like, I guarantee you Steve is picking up on this. <laughs> within five minutes, within five minutes of the film, introduced to his daughter, he's telling her how, basically how he met her mother. Yes. And as soon as I kind of twigged that they were going to be doing a flashback throughout most of the movie, that was all I could think of. And I'm watching this, and it's the same goddamn characters. So who ripped who off? Well, now nah, nah, that's a little bit of a trickier one. Because even though the story could be seen to be a rip-off of How I Met Your Mother, yes, How I Met Your Mother did air first. However, the ending of this movie, which, you know, I, it's a romantic comedy. You can guess how it's going to end. Um, but the ending of this movie mirrors the ending of the How I Met Your Mother series, which happened in 2014. So could be they cribbed a little bit from this going uh, on. Um, okay. But yeah, you've got... Uh, Ryan Reynolds himself as Will Hayes, who everyone just refers to as Will Hayes. They don't say, hi, Will. They go, hey, Will Hayes. How are you doing, Will Hayes? You're looking well, Will Hayes. And I guess annoying. Um, he's basically Ted. 
Okay. Um, and then you've got Isla Fisher's character is like Robin, the girl that keeps coming in and out of your life after a bit. Then Rachel. Oh, and not as in like robbing shit. No, as in stealing. No. Um, his uh, his roommate, I can't remember his name. He's basically Marshall. You know, Kevin Klein's basically Barney, and the whole thing just plays out. I was just like, wait, what? I, I, I've seen this. I've seen all nine series of this. C- come on. Now, <laughs> in terms of it actually being a film, let's put the comparisons to one side. In terms of it being a film, it's very. It is a film. You know. Yes. I don't really think it's anything particularly spectacular, but it's not really anything massively offensive in any way. Even if you were to watch it just as in passing, you'd probably go, oh, it's, it's all right. <laughs> and I think that's the best way to describe it. It's just, it's all right. There's a couple of it things is. which did kind of pique my interest, though. Um, well, on the opening, he's got a little narration, and already I could think of, ah, that's what happened in Deadpool. Yeah, And other Ryan Reynolds movies. Yeah. But one thing I would like to ask is at the very beginning, he's walking down the street. Now, this was this movie came out in 2008, and he's walking down the street, and he puts his headphones in. They have no cables. Why did they have no cables ah. in 2008? Ah, that's interesting. You know, all, all like the airports and stuff, they didn't come out until, what, about three years ago? Stuff like yeah. that. That's a very interesting thing to pick up on. Yeah. Even I didn't pick up on that. And I watched it myself as well. And uh, there was a couple of things that really stuck out for me as well. Um, if you don't mind me interjecting on your review, I'm sure you've got some other scathing things to put in there. <laughs> Which you can wait because some of them might be in line with what I say. For for one, um, go on. Then. The movie was directed by a man called Adam Brooks. He directed another film called Almost You, but mainly he was known as the writer on stuff like Bridget Jones: The Edge of Reason. So he is the man who wrote the weakest Bridget Jones movie <laughs> mm-hmm. out of all the one that kind of everyone tends to forget. Uh, what I did notice about this movie is for the girlfriends they were taking that deep rising casting method. Let's cast a Canadian, a Brit, and an Aussie going out of an American. <laughs> no, he's so, Canadian. Oh, Canadian. Oh, and we've got the American in Kevin Klein, I guess. Yeah. And and There's... Rachel Rachel Banks. Not Rachel uh, Banks, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Banks. Banks. Why do I keep doing that? Elizabeth Banks. Well, I guess she's the American. Yeah, yeah. so that would work. And yes, yeah, so I did know about the How I Met Your Mother similarity, and I knew you would pick up on it straight away. But in watching this again, and I watched it when it first came out, and I watched it again just this past week to get ready for this show, because I thought, I need a bit of a refresher on it. Mm-hmm. Romance and politics. Hmm. Doesn't... Strange bedfellows, aren't they? They're, they're very strange bedfellows. I wouldn't exactly class them as something that goes well together. Uh, you hear that, Mr. Clinton? Um, but do you ever get the feeling that this was uh, someone writing about having a child who's never had a child or spent time with one. (laughs) Yeah. Because Abigail Breslin does not speak like a proper child. And to be honest, I'm kind of questionable about this father-daughter relationship. Yeah. (laughs) Because it's like, really? Would you actually tell her half of the shit you are actually telling her in the story? I get it. It's for plot. But yeah, this the kind of thing doesn't really gel as well. I don't think Ryan was the person for it. Well, I don't know though. Ryan Reynolds is he's 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 an effortlessly charming kind of fellow and he cut his teeth in loads of rom coms along the way before he properly then started it, it getting past all that and had his own little reconnaissance. Mac- what what was it? The the Matthew McConaughey re- Renaissance, the McConnaissance? <laughs> yes. Well Ryan Reynolds has basically been yeah, the same that. character ever since. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. pretty, pretty much. Um but there's a lot of that type of stuff which did happen in How I Met Your Mother as well. And there's a couple of asides which they do saying, you know, am I a bad father for telling you this? And things. Uh, but yeah, I I am not actually, strictly speaking, a father-father. I am a stepfather. Yeah. Um, and I can say with absolute assurity that no child talks like Abigail Breslin in this movie at all. No. No. De- definitely not. I mean, she's she's great in it. Oh, you yeah. Know, she's fresh off her Little Miss Sunshine uh, run of popularity that uh, you know mm-hmm. it's, she's kind of grown up now and it's nowhere near as popular as she was back then um but ryan reynolds i i just really struggle to see him as the father in this movie and to be honest i'm gonna stand out the entire movie is saved by isla fisher because whenever yeah. isla fisher is not on screen you want the movie to be back on her <laughs> 
We want the movie to be asking, where's Isla Fisher? Now, if this was the other way round and Isla Fisher was either the mother or someone like that, Mm -hmm. it would be so much a better movie experience. She shines, and she is. She's absolutely incredible. I don't believe she's got it just you in in Hollywood. Uh, And I think a proper leading role that's not Confessions of a Shopaholic. Yeah. (laughs) You know, in, in something like this, you know, would have been much better. But she did great with what she had, and she was yeah. a standout for me. Yeah, I mean, I think they all did. I think Elizabeth Banks' character was the most undercooked out of uh, all of the, the female leads, without question. She just kind of comes in at the beginning and comes in at the end, and there's never any kind of growth or experience that she has, which is kind of transformative. Unlike the other two, you kind of get the feeling that they're both building to something and then changing how they are as characters which reflects what people do in life we change whereas elizabeth banks just seemed to be exactly the same at the beginning as she was at the end except so maybe slightly elizabeth and erotic. elizabeth banks is a bookend character in this Pretty movie much. if you have ever seen one. Oh god yeah it, that there is no arc for that character whatsoever it is just the ultimate Here's the start and here's the end. Yeah. If anything, it's just a tool for uh, Ryan Reynolds, you know, to say where he was and where he ends up. And uh, at least he does, spoiler alert, does end up with Isla Fisher at the end. So it's all kind of happy, even though I, I do kind of question the reason why they fell out. Yeah. Although one thing that I will point out, I didn't notice at the time, but uh, but uh, my girlfriend Amanda, she pointed it out. She said uh, right at the very end where Isla Fisher comes out of the apartment building, goes running over to him, gives him a hug. Um, His daughter, Abigail Breslin, is stood behind him. But then when you get the reverse shot, you actually see she was stood in the middle of the road. (laughs) And and those two were standing on the pavement. (laughs) Now we're back to this problematic parenting, Ryan. Really? (laughs) Don't you think that custody should have gone to the mother in this case? Because I'm having some serious doubts about you as a father. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> mm. But, uh, yeah, so definitely maybe. Uh, is it on your list of recommendations or is it just meh? I think it's a very meh film, really. I mean, it's summed up by the title more than anything else. It's a, it's a maybe film. If it's on and you've got nothing better to do and you might have some ironing to do or, you know, you, you, you've got to sew a hole in your socks or whatever and you just need something on in the background, stick it on. But eh, it's it's inoffensive wallpaper, really. Okay, well, that is definitely maybe, and I guess now, as always, we seek into our anniversary section. We watch them again all of the time or we get them on Prime for free But we only know how old they are when we learn their anniversary. And this is basically the equivalent of going from a high peak to a complete flop because <laughs> we just forgot that we still have that same music again. <laughs> we should have used that Slim Whitman one, shouldn't we? We should have. We should have. Uh, but anyway, anniversaries, we have four this week. Uh, so uh, I went for some really obvious ones and I also went for two wild cards Ooh, as well. Oh, okay. Right, in that case, hit me with it, Andy. Okay, well, we are going to start with an obvious one. Can you believe, Steve? Mm -hmm. 35 years ago this week, Lethal Weapon was released. Oh, the original. The original, of course. Brilliant. Brilliant. And some would say the best. I I think it's on par with Lethal Weapon 2, but that's just me. Uh, Yeah, yeah. I think they've all got their their ups and their downs. I think... uh... I think this one doesn't lean quite as heavily into the comedy as the other two, as the other three do, which is slightly to its detriment. But at the same time, I, I do like that hard reg that it's got compared to the others. Well, this is the movie that Richard Donner turned down Superman for, the quest for peace to direct. <laughs> oh boy, th- did he dodge that bullet! Oof, <clears throat> Jesus! Ah, oh, well, Superman can dodge a bullet, but that movie, Jesus, I couldn't dodge a freight train. Uh, and Richard Donner, uh, you know, he'd spent the last couple of years doing Superman. Uh, Lady Hawk, but um, he just decides to jump out with this ultra violent 80s action buddy buddy movie. Uh, um, speaking of jumping out, this movie does actually have one of my favorite stunts ever because it is seamless and it's the jump off the balcony at the beginning. Oh, yes, 
I'm assuming that a lot of people out there have seen Lethal Weapon, but for the five of you that haven't, let me just break it down. There's a girl, she dies off a balcony, uh, committing suicide, and that kicks off the whole plot from there on in. Um, and the camera follows her as she's falling down and falling down, and eventually she hits the top of a car. Now, there's one shot where she is falling, free-falling, and it looks like the the next frame of this, she's going to smash into the car, but they cut. But the reason that they cut is because it's actually a giant airbag which has got a photograph, a perfectly angled photograph of the cars that are underneath her on top of it. It's brilliant. It is so seamless, it's so simple, and it works wonderfully. And I guarantee you, even now, if you watch that scene, you cannot tell the difference unless you really properly look. Oh, yes, and it's beautifully edited, that scene as well, Super. just to cut away right at the right moment. Yeah. Um, as one of my favourite scenes, which um, <laughs> just to kind of lower the tone a little bit here it's the mel gibson uh, attempted suicide scene when he's got the uh, you know the gun to his head when he's oh, contemplating yeah. suicide uh it's just absolutely incredible to see it is really realistic and apparently uh, from what I hear, there was an actual blank in that gun during the suicide scene for added reality. You try and do that shit nowadays. No. No. <laughs> if that thing would have gone on, that still could have killed him with the shell casing. Jesus Christ, yeah. But, you know, this was the time when Mel was, you know, he was known for playing crazy characters like Mad Max and, and obviously not Martin Riggs. And now the guy really has lost his mind, apparently. Yeah. But uh, the the strange thing here, yet again... Jesus, I cannot believe this rears its head yet again. Did you know that uh, back in the day, Mel Gibson was actually considered for the John McClane role in Die Hard, and Bruce Willis was actually <laughs> in consideration oh, for Martin me. Riggs? Bruce Willis seems to get around a lot on this show. No, I could not even imagine Bruce Willis at the height of his powers being able to pull off that scene it, to that kind of level and I will give full props to Mel Gibson like you say he's lost his he's lost his mind in recent years and gone properly bonkers and mental um but that particular scene that is an that is a wonderfully acted oh god it's the tension in that scene from the direction the music everything in that is perfect it's it's a proper example of a man who's in so much pain and anguish that he can barely control it I can remember um, reading something about it. I think someone had actually seen... Oh, that was it. It was um, the guy who directed the version of Hamlet that Mel Gibson starred in. Apparently he oh, yeah. saw uh, that scene and knew straight away that Mel was the choice for Hamlet. Another little bit of trivia here, speaking of the whole Bruce Willis thing. Did you know that um, Die Hard with a Vengeance was actually considered for a Lethal Weapon movie. The actual script was considered for a plot um, line for Lethal I Weapon. I don't think I did, no. I knew that it had been shopped around a lot because it was its original, because it was Jonathan Hensley. Mm. Um, so he, he got shopped around a bit as being Simon Says and then it got adapted as Le as uh, Die, Hard. Die Hard. But I, no, I didn't realise it had been considered as Lethal Weapon film either. Uh, I didn't either. Just another interesting bit of trivia from around the world of audio commentaries. Uh, one thing I always remember about this film as a kid when I first saw it is this movie was dedicated to the stuntman Dar Robinson, uh, who infamously did the, the jumping off the roof with the suicidal jumper uh, with the uh, non-existent handcuffs. <laughs> <laughs> that still is in every version to this day. Yeah. But Dar Robinson was a stuntman. Uh, he was killed in a motorcycle accident before this movie got released. So it was the last project he'd done, and he had done so many stunt uh, movies. I remember seeing uh, a thing that was on TV, uh, I think it was hosted by Christopher Reeve, where they were talking about Dar Robinson's career, and I remember them focusing a lot on that stunt as probably one of his last. So was he actually playing the jumper? Or was no, he... no, 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 he was um, he was like Mel Gibson's stunt double right, in that movie okay. uh, for a lot of the stuff. And uh, speaking of uh, little cameos there, do you know the scene where the Christmas tree drug dealers at the beginning? Yes. <laughs> yes. Did you notice that one of the drug dealers is the father of Anthony Cletus from the Red Hot Chili Peppers? <laughs> no, I didn't. I do know that yes. one of them kind of looks like the ghost of Christmas past from um, Scrooge. <laughs> so I... is that the it's... same guy? No, no. It's, it's, it's very noticeable of Anthony Cletus because... 
especially when you watch Point Break, where Anthony Cletus actually appears and then beats down Keanu Reeves. Cletus, sorry. Did I say Cletus? Cletus. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Yeah, Cletus, yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a very big similarity between the both of them, but I was surprised to learn that this was actually um, the father of Anthony Cletus from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I was also surprised to learn that Spock himself was once considered to direct this movie instead of Richard Donner. I can't it's, picture that either. No, it would be uh, Roger Murtaugh oh. teamed up with a little glowing rock. <laughs> a little <laughs> suicidal <laughs> glowing rock. <laughs> that just wants to go around and, and solve crime. I'm too old for this laser disc. Yes. <laughs> but uh, this was actually the only Lethal Weapon movie not to make $100 million at the box office. So this is actually the mm. lowest grossing Lethal Weapon movie out of all of them, which is very surprising because it's actually Speaking one of, the best. of Lethal Weapon, I actually remember hearing recently, hold on one second, let me bring up his name, because the guy who played the, um, oh yeah, Mitchell Ryan. Yeah, Mitchell Ryan passed away last passed week. Passed away this yeah. week, yeah. Yeah, and that that kind of flagged up on my, uh, my thing. So I'm actually kind of glad that you brought that up because he went on to play loads of other roles and it was always usually kind of like a more fathery kind of figure but uh but yeah he was being a proper badass in this one yeah, wasn't he general McAllister, i think yeah. his name was yeah yeah I, I got that news also uh and funnily enough i was i was looking through my facebook memories today and <laughs> the amazing thing is nine years ago today i was actually standing in the murtov household that is on um columbia ranch in los angeles so i actually have been in the murtov house it gets demolished in every single Lethal Weapon movie to some extent. Yeah. <laughs> or someone dies in it. It's amazing. That's the most cursed house. And it's right next door to the Griswold's house from the Vacation movies. A little Isn't bit of trivia there. Isn't it the same street that they also filmed The Burbs on? No. The Burbs no. was at Universal Studios. I have actually been on that street also. Right. Okay. And here is the most random bit of trivia that you are going to say there is no way in hell that is true. Right? And apparently it is. And if I'm wrong, someone needs to let me know because I've, I've read this on a number of places. Do you know who was once approached to play Martin Riggs? Lauren Bacall. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren Bacall. The, per- the reason why this person could not get the, didn't get the role is because they couldn't get the accent right and because they wanted to record a single for the soundtrack. Dennis Waterman? No, even worse. <laughs> yeah. I know the reaction from this as soon as I tell you. Nick Berry. Oh, the bloke from the EastEnders? Yes, who was also in Frickin' Heartbeat. <laughs> no. Yes. No. Yes. No Apparently, way was he ever going to be Riggs. Come on. I, I didn't want to believe this myself, but there is a few sources out there that say this is actually true. And, you know, was this seen as a big Hollywood break for him? Possibly. He hasn't had one since. No. But, uh, right. It, it was a proper Dennis Waterman moment. I want to sing the Lethal Weapon song. I want to sing the theme tune, write the theme tune. Uh, right. <laughs> if there's anybody who's listening to this, uh, Lauren Shuler, Donna, hopefully you are listening to this because, you know, we've had a number of people that have spoken very highly of you guys on here. Um, doubtful. But uh, anyone that's listening to this has got any kind of input into whether or not this is true, we want to hear from you. Yep. Yeah. Dan, I want Nick Berry. Nick yeah. Berry, pick up the phone, dude. Message me. I want to hear that if you were approached for this role, I want to hear why you did not get this role. Yeah. Because uh, this is just too good to be true. Um, my personal standouts from Lethal Weapon. I'm actually going to put Danny Glover as you know right up there as the mm-hmm. number one. I think he was absolutely amazing. This and the woman who played his wife, she was amazing in it as well. Yeah. Uh, it, it was just really great. For me, that Eric Clapton, Michael Carmen score is always going to be there. Lethal Weapon Sax is a thing that lives on in my phone. That is my ringtone to this day. Mainly because it's like I have certain ringtones for certain people. If it's people who I just know are going to make me feel really shit, I put the Lethal Weapon Sax as their <laughs> ringtone. <laughs> just to set their mood right. Uh, but yeah, uh, Lethal Weapon's 35 years old this week. Yeah. Well, before we go, actually, if I'm right, and I think I'm right on this one, there's one last fact that I know about it. The mobile phone that he uses, the big kind of oh, yeah. suitcase-sized battery with the little handset, if I remember correctly, that is the first time that a mobile phone was seen used on a film. Ah, but it wasn't the first time that 
that very model of mobile phone was seen in a toy because it used to come with the face action figure from the 80s. There you go. <laughs> and I know because I had it as a kid. There you go. So that means face probably had one on TV. Probably, but it wasn't in a film, was it? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Um, can you believe, Steve? Mm-hmm. Uh, you probably can because I know you haven't seen this film, but nine years ago this week, a movie called Dead Man Down was released. Dead Man Down. No, it doesn't ring any bells, that one. No. Okay, well, I recently just watched this again this week, and I was surprised to learn that it actually came out this week, so I thought, okay, it's a worthy inclusion. This was directed by Niels Arden Oplev. All three of them. All three, <laughs> yes, all three of them, <laughs> who you may know as the directors of the original Girl with the Dragon Tattoo before it was remade by David Fincher. Uh, also directed foreign movies called We Shall Overcome. There was a movie called Daniel. And unfortunately, he also directed that remake of Flatliners that probably not a lot of people saw and probably shouldn't. It, it was really bad. Uh, and it tells the story of a crime lord played by Terence Howard, who has a right-hand man played by Colin Farrell, who helps uh, Numi Rapace seek retribution on the man who scarred her following an incident. And that's all I'm going to give you away, because you might actually want to see it someday. It's really good. I wonder if they have that kind of relationship, and you see it with a lot of people, like with Richard Donner, where they get the same kind of actors back time and time again. True. She must have told him, fuck you on Flatliners, though. Yeah. Um, <sighs> Dead Man Down. Unfortunately, um, the director, Niels Arden Oplev, one person, uh, he actually disowned, not the movie, but he actually disowned the advertising campaign for this movie, for misrepresentation. Uh, he was also complained that there was budget problems. Apparently, he had to speed up the shoot, so he wasn't able to edit it the way that he wanted. But in regards to all that, it's still a great movie. I would be interested to see what his vision was, because this is a really solid, great movie that unfortunately not a lot of people saw. And you, you've got great supporting characters in there. You've got F. Murray Abraham. Remember mm -hmm. him? Oh, yeah. He killed Mozart. I kill a lot of people. Yes. <laughs> uh, you also have Isabel Huppert, amazing French actress, legendary. You also have Dominic Cooper, oh, Howard yeah. Stark himself. And <laughs> in his first movie role, a man called Stu Bennett, who some of you wrestling fans will know as Wade Barrett or Bad News Barrett. And this is the reason being is because WWE Films co-financed this movie, so naturally they had to chuck one of their actors in there. And this kind of kick-started Stu Bennett now being an action movie star in director video fair um, that some of you may have just come across on Now TV or something like that. But I really like the pace and tone of the movie. I really like the look of the movie as well. It's got a really distinct, moody look. Uh, it's incredibly well acted. And after seeing... Colin Farrell as the Penguin uh, the other day in a role that you would never guess it is Colin Farrell in a million years if you didn't know. And, and in this movie, he's really well done. And uh, I think it's a film that you should go out of your way to discover. It is on Netflix at the moment for those of you who want to delve in and watch it. And uh, I actually got my uh, DP, Director of Photography, for people who don't know what DP means, Got him to watch it the other night, and he said, wow, this movie is cool. This has given me some great ideas. So there you go. That's why I just wanted to include it this week. Oh, fair enough. Can you believe, Steve? Go on. Going back to a more obvious and famous one. 25 years ago this week, Jerry Maguire was released. Show me the monkey. <laughs> yes, the movie with more catchphrases than The Godfather. I know. I've not seen it, though, but by God, it was everywhere. You couldn't escape it. It is in the box. You are going to come across it. Uh, a movie directed by Cameron Crowe, who just manages to belt out the really great movies like Almost Famous uh, Singles, which I believe was one of... Well, no, it wasn't his first, because Say Anything was his first, uh, which is another great movie. And Vanilla Sky, which people are kind of divided on if it's a good movie or not. I happen to think it is. Uh, Jerry Maguire is kind of a little bit of a magic movie, really. Uh, especially for Renee Zellweger, who apparently that morning of learning she had been cast, she had no money in her bank account at all. She couldn't even withdraw $5 from her account, and wow. then she learned she's been cast. And it catapulted her career. 
But the scary thing about this is that this script was originally written for Tom Hanks and Winona Ryder. Okay. Let that sink in. <laughs> Why is it not? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, it went on to star, obviously, Tom Cruise in what became one of his greatest roles of all time. Uh, you had Cuba Gooding Jr., which has been kind of yep. his only good role of all time. Yeah, what happened to him? He basically went straight from there to doing shit like Snow Dogs. <laughs> Chill Factor happened. Yeah, what the That's hell? That's what happened. That that shit nailed his career shut. And I, th- I can see what they were thinking. This is going to be like what Speed did for Keanu and, and, and you know Broken Arrow did for John Travolta, etc. He was an Oscar winner, for God's sake. And then he just ended up, you know, slinking down the pile. Uh, Renee Zellweger, who wasn't a major name, I think she only had Empire Records and a couple of other mm-hmm. things like a Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie and stuff like that uh, to her credit. And, of course, the debut of a little child actor by the name of Jonathan Lipnicki mm. uh, before he went on to do Stuart Little. But, you know, this was the movie that got him noticed. And I, I heard a fantastic story on Graham Norton when Cuba Gooding Jr. was on it. And he was talking about uh, bringing his dad to set. And his dad is uh, <laughs> his dad was not very uh, subtle, can we say. He, he was very up front and out there. And apparently, as soon as Cuba Gooding Jr. introduced his dad to Tom Cruise, Cuba Gooding Jr.'s dad just said, so are you gay or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just just when you want to bring your dad to set, there's a good reason why sometimes. Uh, but there's some interesting uh, things about this uh, movie. And it is a great movie. It is in the box. You are going to see it. Okay. But uh, this movie still, to this day, holds the record for the lowest gross of a number one movie at a weekend box office with just $5.5 in ticket sales. Now, I will actually go and say that this is only because uh, this stands from seven weeks after release because it was on a renewed interest during its Best Picture nomination. So it was kind right. of a, a re-release. But it has the still the record in lowest gross of an, that number one movie on that weekend. Um, this was up for Best Picture in 1996, and it was the only movie from a major studio that was nominated for Best Picture. All the rest were from kind of independence. So you had The English Patient, Secrets and Lies, Shine and Fargo were the other movies nice. that were up for that year. Uh, Tom Cruise also won his Golden Globe. I'm not sure if it was his first. I think it was uh, for his role as Jerry Maguire. And here's an interesting thing. Right? It was handed to him by John Travolta. It uh, also made sense because Kelly Preston, who is also a Scientologist, uh, played uh, one of the love interests in Jerry Maguire. Okay. And uh, obviously it's there to have um, the uh, very famous You Had Me at Hello and You, you complete, complete Me, Show Me the Money. Well, did you know, You Complete Me is actually a phrase that has been used in both DC and Marvel movies ever since. Yeah, because it was used by the Joker in Dark Knight. And it was used by uh, Robert Downey Jr. to Pepper Potts in Iron Man 2. Yeah. Uh, And that's the performances. And there's there's great little performances in there too. The music, the soundtrack is brilliant to this movie. I love it. You can hear most of the soundtrack in the trailer for the movie. And it makes you want to see that movie straight away. Uh, So yeah, I recommend Jerry Maguire. And it is in the box. You are going to come across it one day. Okay. Well, one thing that I will say about this is that uh, it goes to prove that as long as you're sticking at it, you never know when the big break's going to come. Renny Zellweger had nothing, and then she's uh, not only in in a, a lead in a massive film, but she's then also kickstarted a career, and she's never looked back. So, never know when it's going to come from. And she was the last Best Actress winner as well, for mm-hmm. Judy, last year. Yeah. Last year? No, was that two years? No, it was two years ago. Oh my God! This is how much COVID and the pandemic has screwed it up. There's yeah. been another Oscars since that I've totally blanked out because I was in LA for the last time the Oscars were there. Was that the one where they were all in like a cafe or something? Was that in between every Oscar they were there going, "You know, we need to stand together against this horrible." Yeah, Jack Nicholson was there. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Jerry Maguire, twenty-five years old this week. Okay, uh, so anniversary. What is your last one? The last one, wildcard time, 
11 years ago this week, uh-huh. a movie simply known as Battle Los Angeles was released. I've I've seen bits of this at the beginning. Okay. This is the one with the aliens, isn't it? Yes. Yes, I've seen bits of this at the beginning, yeah. Okay. Uh, Battle Los Angeles, a uh, bit of a guilty pleasure for me. Uh, I don't know why. I cannot honestly answer the reason why. Uh, it was directed by Jonathan Liebsman, who some of you will know as directing the uh, reboot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that came out a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, way back when, he also directed a horror movie called Darkness Falls, which was a pretty big renter back in its day. And also the uh, the woeful Wrath of the Titans. <laughs> Uh, no. uh, I've, I've tried two times to watch that film and never succeeded I don't think it's necessarily a bad film but I, I think I just uh, why? So it's just uh, Clash of the Titans was alright but this just feels the exact same thing what gets me with this film and all of the movies that came out around about that time like Immortals and all the rest of it is that Disney took one look at that saw how badly it bombed and then just went yeah that's the exact style that we want to show off our new movie Eternals Oh yeah. It all looks the exact same. It looks like a kind of drab. Oh yeah, we've got all these cool special effects. Yeah, but you look shit. Yeah. Well, Battle Los Angeles. It's actually mm. really good. It's like a jacked up Black Hawk Down meets War of the Worlds. Uh, that's exactly how I'd explain it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. And when I when I first saw it, I was like, "This is like Black Hawk Down with aliens." I'm, I'm I'm kind of I'm digging it. But the strange thing is, it's not actually shot in Los Angeles probably shot in canada or somewhere isn't it no it's shot in louisiana right okay and that's that's obviously due to the tax incentive because it is very 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 expensive to shoot in los angeles Mm. i was surprised to learn that shane black actually did some uncredited script work on it Mm. but i can't tell where if it was back in the 90s then i'd be going oh what you mean you can't tell but nowadays we're living in a post the predator uh world (laughs) so you know, Shane Black, it, come on. It, you, don't, you don't even know where he's beginning or ending these days. He used to this be just true. like the mwah, the chef's kiss, mwah, the god of, mwah. you know, he did stuff like, you know, the nice guys, which wasn't, I didn't really dig that much, but you could definitely tell it was a Shane Black movie and it definitely had some good spots. You know, uh, Long Kiss Goodnight and all the rest of it. And it's just Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. It's just, now it's all just bleh, whatever. Yeah, very true. I mean, for its day, uh, and still to this day, I guess, because uh, yet again, I did watch it again. Yeah, the truth is, I do watch all of these movies that have anniversaries just to get a kind of upfront and, and up-to-date a refresh. take on them. A refresher. Yes. yes. I mean, this still is a very realistic depiction of what an alien attack would look like. Mm. Um, much more so than Monsters that came out, I think, the year before, and then Monsters Dark Continent or whatever it was, which was a lackluster sequel to it but this is the the movie that Aaron Eckhart really threw himself into it he really did throw himself he, he really believed in this so much so that he even broke his arm doing the movie and carried on Ooh. <laughs> incorporated it into the script and get going it's like awesome dude nice um but a little bit of uh information do you know that this was the very first movie to be released in 4k really Really? What on home video or in like the cinema? What? What? Yeah. On, on... It, well, in 4K in general, this was the first movie converted into 4K. Wow, that's quite surprising. Yeah, it is. You know, but I guess uh, who was it? Was this a Sony movie? I have a feeling this was a a, a Sony Columbia movie. So this might have been the tester for it. And, and you can certainly tell. It's made me kind of interested in why this movie was chosen because there must have been a hell of a lot of other movies that would have benefited greatly. I mean, I would have thought a movie that came out around the same time by the same studio such as Hugo, right, Hugo, I would have thought that would have been the, the trial for Yeah, but for I, 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 could, I could probably see... I, I, the problem that you've got is with Hugo, isn't that mostly animated? In a sense, but realistically, right. when you look at Battle Los Angeles, it is a lot of shaky hand cam style shooting. Right. Yeah, but we, it, it's it's a more realistically shot movie. So if you're going to try and promote something which is supposed to show off a more realistic image, you want something which is going to be more realistic and then kind of like the fantasy stuff of Hugo, really, though, wouldn't you? I mean, yeah, you can get some magnificent effects to come out of that. But if you're actually aiming to show, look, this is real life, just writ large, 
in terms yeah. of visuals, then something more like this is is a better is a better fit. I would have thought. Yeah, true. Actually, that that is a good point. I mean, and this movie has, you know, it has everything surrounded that. The special effects in it are brilliant. They they really are good. You know, mm. considering you're watching something that is a lot of shaky cam and stuff, they they really work those uh, special effects and visual effects in really well. The sound is great. It's got real pumping score as well. Really gets you involved with it. And funnily enough, the standouts for this movie uh, are actually Michelle Rodriguez and Michael Pina. Mm-hmm. You know, th- this is their movie in in my view. Uh, it really showcased them in a different light. It's good to see Michelle Rodriguez doing anything but a Fast and the Furious movie, and it's good to see Michael Pina doing something than other playing was it Luis on yeah, Ant Man, just something which isn't just like the comic relief. Yeah, you know yeah. they they had them as as really grounded, and for an alien invasion like war movie, it's amazing how grounded this really is. Well, if you, you know, think about it, that's that's been kind of like the way that stuff like War of the Worlds has been for years. Uh, maybe not the one the movie that was. Uh, shot in like the 50s or something but a lot of the everything going back to like the original story is more about what's suggested than what is actually there if you look at the Orson Welles version uh, the radio broadcast all of that was presented as real and the reality of it helped to sell it more than just having just like and there's a great big monster coming around it's stomping around the place so as soon as the great big stompy monster comes in then that kind of takes you out the the reality of the situation whereas if you're looking at it as it is then you could easily believe okay this isn't a battle zone this is happening the this could easily be in the middle east or or it could be as we're going through at the moment in the ukraine or somewhere like that you know it, it could be an actual war zone then when the monsters come out, you realise, oh, okay, no, this is all just, like, alien. So keeping the monsters down to a minimum helps the film, I'd say. Exactly. You know, so to end on that, 11 years ago, Battle Los Angeles introduced its aliens, but it's not the only time aliens are going to be the focus of our show this week. No. No, because we have a very special anniversary edition of our show. And to do this, we have called on... Our regular man from the WB, Mr. BD. Well, it's time to hook up with our series regular. That'll be former Warner Brothers Senior Vice President Bill Daly, because it is yet again fallen upon a special anniversary this week. Can you believe, Steve? 25 years ago this week, Mars Attacks was the box office number one in the UK. With a huge cast of stars, a cruel sense of humour, a director known for quirky movies, and the biggest budget schlock movie Hollywood may have ever seen. It's been deemed by some as a classic, and others have deemed it the worst big budget movie not worth the paper it was written on. Now this is kind of typical feedback from whenever Tim Burton takes on an established franchise, with movies such as Sleepy Hollow, Planet of the Apes, Alice in Wonderland, also getting that same critical backlash over the years. But the greatest thing about Mars Attacks is that it is a faithful homage to 50s sci-fi and Ed Wood movies, of which Tim Burton obviously knows a thing or two about. Mm -hmm. Now, people expecting a continuation of the previous year's blockbuster Independence Day were bound to be disappointed, but those who loved things a bit more surreal, they were having a blast with the mayhem. And as we've always, when we do our research, there's always the potential that the research we do could turn out to be a load of shit. Because IMDB lies! And so does the internet, of course. <laughs> Apparently, there's a war going on. So, to discuss this specific movie from uh, its earliest beginnings, pre production to release and legacy, we welcome the fact checker himself, all the way from Los Angeles, Bill Daly. Good morning, Bill. <laughs> Hello. Good morning, Bill. How are you? I'm I'm pleased to be back. Um, can I just say one thing? Yes. It's two things. I, I already have corrections. Speaking. Okay. <laughs> two things. Um, it may have gotten number one in the box office in the UK, but not in the US. It peaked yes. at number two. The, and that was the first week where it only made nine million dollars the first week, which was not. That's about ten percent of the budget, right there. Yeah, that's catering. Um, yeah, um, uh, <laughs> it only got to number two, and 
I don't know why the constant comparison with Independence Day, because I've seen I've seen it online as well. Yeah. Um, knowing that we were talking about that, I looked on IMDb Pro and I looked at Google, um, and I've seen mention of Independence Day, and I have absolutely no idea why. A different studio, different year, different stars, different director. I think it's just the central alien invasion premise behind it all. Uh, perhaps, yeah. Um, so that, those are the two big corrections. But if I may, and I hope this doesn't step on anything you want to ask me, you know, as we proceed forward. Um, yes, there's a lot of homage to the 50s, you know, and all that. But um, I remember these trading cards. I had them when I was a kid. I didn't have the entire collection, but I had them. And I used to buy them. I was fascinated with the planet Mars when I was a kid. And I don't know why. But this is the 60s. President Kennedy is in these cards. There's at least one card. I think there's two where President Kennedy's actually in it. So we're talking 19... He became president in 61 through 63. So this is 60s. Now, it's leftover 50s. I think the 50s probably really ended with... Kennedy, right? I guess the sixties sort of began then. Yeah. So I kind of get that, and there and yes, there is a lot of homage to the fifties, and it's and that was one of the things I thought was really cool about this movie. Well, definitely, as we've said, we know that a lot of the things that we ask today, there's going to be some truth to them, there's going to be some falseness to them, and this is the reason why we always love to bring you on because we get at least the truth from the person who was there, and of course, some things you might not know. Right. And I guarantee you, there's a lot I don't know on this. I do, there's stuff I just don't remember. And um, there are things that I saw uh, when I in Wikipedia that um, don't ring true to me, but I can't definitively say that it's false. Okay. Well, at least we can get your opinion on it. Yeah. yeah. So, so with that in mind, uh, we'll start from the top. When was talk of Mars Attacks first brought up at Warner Brothers? Uh, we say there's no comparison with Independence Day. They were just two films that were kind of released roughly around the kind of same time frame. I don't remember exactly when it came up. I do remember it coming up. And I remember my boss at the time, um, Amy Ravens, the late Amy Ravens, um, told me that it was coming up. And I was like, seriously? Because I remembered the trading cards. and She was fascinated to know that I had these trading cards and I, I just couldn't believe that they found a story to go along with these but but it was Tim Burton and um, there were a lot of things that Tim Burton did that people questioned and it turned out he was right all the time like people couldn't imagine Michael Keaton as Batman and then they couldn't imagine Batman without him so <laughs> I just couldn't believe that they were going to do something with these cards um, but it was Tim Burton doing it and I thought this is going to be really cool this is going to be really really cool and then when I saw the people that they were talking about for cast um, I wanted to be a part of it because there were so many um, this is a wonderful cast in this so many great people that I admire so um, I was very happy to be part of it which way around did it go was the director chosen first or was the idea chosen first because uh, from what we've gathered it was tim burton that brought the idea to the execs by showing them the yes. trading cards yeah it was tim tim had brought it tim was busy at the time with um, james and the giant peach which was largely but not completely being done out of town some of it in uk and um, a lot of it in the san francisco area so he, he was heavily involved in that, and um, and I think he saw an opportunity. Um, Batman was going elsewhere. That was going to um, Joel Schumacher and uh, Tim. And it's, the studio always wanted to have a good relationship with Tim. And whenever he wanted to do something, they would listen. If he brought something to the studio, they would listen. Everybody likes Tim. Did Warner Brothers actually purchase the rights for Mars Attacks on his behalf? I believe so, yes, because it was owned by the Topps Trading Card Company. So, like, I wasn't part of those negotiations. I, I never was. But, but I do remember a big package coming from Topps, including reprints of a lot of these cards. Um, I've since given them away. Um, I, I've given a lot of my stuff away, even after I, I just collected up a package and shipped it to Pennsylvania with stuff that I had from Barry's. 
um, films. And Andrew's visiting LA next month, and he's going to get my Mars Attacks crew hat. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm so having that. <laughs> well, that's cool. Uh, you know, I, I didn't realize I still had it until um, you guys asked me to do this. And I was like, oh, I think I still have that hat. I think I saw it somewhere. Um, and it was exactly where I thought it was. I still have the crew jacket. The crew jacket was quite nice. And um, and I liked having it. Um, so I still have that. I still have the hat. Um, they may be the only things I still have from Mars Attacks. So soon it will just be the jacket. And the books. There's a couple of books. Um there were books published about the artwork. I think there were two different books published about the art of Mars Attacks. And there was um, an issue of some cinephile um, magazine that's really slick, a really nice, nicely done thing that concentrates on cinematography and art direction and stuff. Um, and I have that. That's Those are on my bookshelf. I do like books like that. I'm not going to lie. I, I love things which have got concept art in them. Um, well, Burton wrote the script, uh, but went uncredited, and there's also mention of Jonathan Gems writing and uh, uncredited work by Scott Alexander and Landy Karazewski. Larry. Larry. Um, so, exactly how much was uh, brought in from which writer? Do I know? don't know. No, I honestly don't know. I have, I still have a script, um, or the colored pages, so I don't have the original white um, script that would have the original on there before other people were contributing to it. So um, I don't know. That's another thing on my bookshelf is the original script. Um, I can send that. I can even, I can you know scan it as a PDF and email it to you guys if you want. Perhaps I should have done that before we were talking. Edit that bit out in case you know there's an NDA. <laughs> no, no, I never had an I never had an on disclosure agreement at Warner Brothers. Um, one time I signed an NDA one time and it was one specific occasion and that had to do with the screening of Superman returns. The, the one that uh, Brian Singer did yeah. and they had a screening and they got everyone to sign an NDA and everybody did. Nobody fussed about it. And I remember Steve Papazian afterwards, I talked to Steve Papazian, who is the president of um, uh, um, physical production. And, you know, and I was telling him about it. And he said, what? They, they made you? You know, I was a senior VP. They made you sign an NDA? And I said, well, you know, it was just a PA that was passing this paperwork out. And you don't want to leave it up to a PA to decide who signs and who does. And you, you just make everybody sign. And he said, yeah, I guess that's right. And th that was my feeling about it, too. If you're going to make, you know, a PA do it, then everybody gets treated the same. But that's the only, that was the one time only thing. And um, I don't even remember what was in that screening, other you know, other than a, a very very early version of that movie. Um, so I, I I couldn't talk about it because I don't. Re it was that memorable, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that I couldn't talk about it. Okay. Well, what is um, that? Martin Amos had worked on a version of the script uh, years before, but claims that not one word of what he wrote was used in the version that came along afterwards. Do you know anything about this earlier version? No, I don't. One of the things I read, and I can't um, add any validity to it or dispute it at all. One of the things I read was that somebody had written a version of the script and then afterwards discovered that the reverse side of the cards actually had a story to it. Yes. And, and I don't recall what the story was as a kid. I was looking at the pictures. I wasn't I, I think they put the story on the back of the cards to get everybody to buy the complete set. And I never owned the complete set um, until they were given to us when the movie was uh, about to start production. Um, so, so I don't know whether it follows it or not. But I'll tell you, um, and I may, perhaps I'm jumping the gun a little bit. There are a lot, there's a lot of composition of, of picture, a lot of frame composition in this movie that mirrors those cards. Yes, yes, I did see something about that years ago. Um, I think it was around about the time that it actually came out, and I do. I've, I've got a vague memory in my head of there being like either a, a transition between the shot of the artwork on the card and one of the frames from the movie, and I remember them lining up pretty closely. Yeah, yeah, they had a, a really nice visual reference in those cards. I imagine Tim probably was collecting them too. He's a few years younger than I am. Uh, but I would imagine he was probably collecting them as a kid. Mm. Well, the aliens are the standout. 
of the whole thing, obviously. Um, and stop motion was originally being used, but uh, we've got word here that the, the studio refused to finance the projected costs, which then led to it going over to CGI by ILM because it was cheaper. Um, so Barry Purvis created the stop motion with a test reel with around 70 animators over eight months. And uh, we've also got word that Larry J. Franco commissioned ILM to create a test reel as one of us was concerned about the escalating costs. So what can you tell me about this battle? Um, it had it, cost entered into it, but I think the cost became a factor um, because it took so long to get the stop motion animation stuff accomplished. They, uh, for some reason, all the projects I've been involved with that that included animation, you know, compositing animation with um, with live action. We just picked the wrong animating team, you know. And um, and the thing is that um, I don't remember Barry specifically. I do remember a woman that was in charge over there. I I don't remember her name. I can picture her perfectly, um, but I don't remember her name. Um, and I really liked those people. We took over a building that was adjacent to. Uh, what is now known as the lot. Um, it was um, it was the original Fairbanks studio in LA, and then became United Artists Studio. Then um, eventually became uh, oh, then became Sam Goldwyn Studio. Then became Warner Hollywood, um, and Warner Brothers ended up. It's a long story, but they ended up owning too many facilities and and felt the need to. Um, you know, cut some some of them loose. Um, so now that studio is called the Lot. That's where we shot the interiors for the movie. But adjacent to it was a place called Introvision, and we took over their building, and that's where the stop motion animation stuff was going. And I and I have to tell you, I was quite excited about doing it because my wife and I used to go to the animation festivals, and we fell in love with Wallace and Gromit. And the first thing that <laughs> I was told was that they were going to do claymation for this. And I thought, Oh, I want to be part of this, you know, because I was just fascinated. I, I like working on new things, getting, getting experience in new things, you know, um, having to understand, I just like being involved and I, I've always enjoyed the process. Um, so I was quite excited about being involved with this. It, it turned out that they weren't actually using clay. They were doing these, uh, sort of like they did with uh, corpse bride, these sort of like twisty, kind of like Gumby figures, but, you know, yeah. kind of twisty, you know, um, toys. Larry Franco came on. Larry Franco is a great line producer. Absolutely one of the best line producers you could ask for. He would be on my top five list if I were doing something. He'd be one of the people to reach out to, to see if they were available. Um, Larry had just come off Jumanji, and he had a very good experience with ILM. And at some point, um, he was calculating the numbers and said, why are we doing, doing it this way when we could just go to ILM? And so he got ILM to do a test and a budget and everything in it. And it, it came in much less than what we were doing. We were, wa our people were wasting a lot of time. I honestly, they were wasting a lot of time doing this. In fairness, the studio couldn't make up their mind about how they wanted this to look. And the thing about ILM was that you could give them little tweaks and stuff, and they, they would incorporate that into what they were doing because it was all digital. It was, they weren't physically shooting things. And it became a lot harder to replace things if you were going to do it um, the way we originally envisioned doing this thing. So, so moving over to ILM was a smart move for everybody because we were able to get the movie done. We might not have gotten it done otherwise. Well, there's a couple of shots in there, and I don't know, it probably is just the exceptional work that ILM have done, but there are a couple of shots where I'm sure that it's someone in a suit, but they've just had a digital head replacement. So the entire entirety of the creatures, they are just CG. Yeah, as far yeah. as I know. Okay, cool. What happened was when, when they decided to move up to um, ILM, most of the film had already been shot, so... They also moved the sound and the editorial up to Skywalker Ranch so they could be closer to ILM to go and, you know, they could listen to what the sound mix was going to be and they could look at what the visual effects were. So everybody moved out of town. So um, there were a lot of things that were, and, you know, San Francisco is like 400 miles away. So a lot of stuff was done. It was all remotely done. And I, I do remember visiting them at least once, maybe twice when they were up there. And everything was just going great. Uh, well, 
the aliens and the uh, animation that was done for the movie was incredibly impressive, uh, especially with the amount of shots that they've done. But more impressive is the sheer volume of cast that this movie had. And it's even more impressive when you kind of look through some of the trivia here about original casting decisions. Now, if they were true or not, we're about to find out. First one being is that Warren Beatty was originally cast as the president role that eventually became Jack Nicholson. But before Jack Nicholson, apparently Paul Newman uh, was approached who turned down the project over the violence in the script. Is any of this true? I don't know. Um, Warren was on the lot doing, um, um, or had been on the lot, I think a year before doing Love Affair. Yes. And, um, another one, and, and Pierce Brosnan was in that one as well, who, who was also in Mars Tex. Um, it's possible they talked to him, um, if they made an offer or not, I'm not aware of it. Well, Annette Benning was in the movie. Yes. Yes, she was. So, yes. It's quite, feasible. um, as she was in Love Affair as well. So, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. And, and it could be that Warren um, got a better offer on something else. It may be that there was um, this, that happens a lot where, you know, you're, you're on track to do something. And then then some project that you've been already developing for a long time suddenly um, gets greenlit really quickly. And there's a small window of opportunity to do it. I've seen that many times. Uh, it's possible with him. The Paul Newman thing, I never heard that. Um, that would have been interesting. It would have been very, very interesting. Um, I, I worked with Paul on uh, Message in a Bottle, and he's great, absolutely great, wonderful person, great to work with. Um, but I'm really pleased that Jack Nicholson was on this because that's the first time I got to meet Jack Nicholson was on the set um, over at the lot. Um, and, I, and I've always admired Jack, so um, I was pleased it could be when they, when they brought him in as the president and then, um, and then gave him that second part. Um, Art Lund, which I thought was hilarious. Um, I just, um, yeah, I, I was just pleased as could be that it was Jack. Um, and Jack and Tim really work well together. They have a shorthand when they talk to one another. It was amazing to watch the two of them working together because of the, the shorthand they had. Um, and, and I don't know that Tim would have necessarily had that with Paul Newman. Um, but Paul's great. To, I mean, you couldn't go wrong with either one of those people. Oh, yeah. Mm. Well, continuing the uh, the question mark surrounding the casting, uh, was Susan Sarandon originally chosen as the first lady? It's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, they were talking to him about something. I, I knew that there was something Susan Sarandon-wise was going on, but I didn't know what movie it was. It, it easily could have been this, you know. And again, I was pleased as could be a, that it was Glenn Close as well, you know. I've worked with Susan Sarandon when I was doing television, and she's absolutely wonderful to work with. Well, I mean, other casting choices, apparently, um, Hugh Grant was considered for the role that went to Pierce Brosnan. And apparently Alec Baldwin was in late talks for a role, but ended up dropping out also. Yes, he was, Alec Baldwin was in discussions for something I don't remember what. I'm not so sure. It could have it could have been that Pierce was in all along, but I'm not entirely sure. And I was pleased that Pierce was part of this too. I'd seen him when he was on the lot doing um, Love Affair, but um, I never got to meet him. And I and I really wanted to meet him because I had met. Um, well, I have. I even to this day, I have met and spoken with every single person who was James Bond. You know, and at the time, Pierce was was kind of missing from that checklist, and I was so I was pleased this could be to uh, to meet and talk with him. Well, originally Jack Nicholson was planned to just be the president, and then Michael Keaton was going to be playing the Art Land character. Now Nicholson ended up playing both, mm -hmm. but Land has a lot of the characteristics that uh, you usually associate with like a Keaton performance. So what happened there? Was Keaton unavailable? Was he never chosen? I, you know, I don't know. And, and again, you know, Michael had worked with um, Tim a few times um, and Michael did not want to continue with Batman after he met with um, Joel Schumacher. And it wasn't because of Joel. Um, Joel is absolutely wonderful to work with. But um, Michael had a lot of problems with the script. And, um, and I don't blame him. 
personally. I don't I don't blame him. I I would have liked to have seen him continue in that part. Um, but you know, Val Kilmer brought something a little different to it. Um, I I I don't know if there was a problem or availability. He may not have been able to travel. He might have gotten something else. I don't know. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's true that Michael was um, in line to do something. You know, it, it, so many people signed on to do this movie, and and you know, it was a cast of um, a lot of really big and familiar names. Um, it got to the point where people were begging to come on. You know, just like we had every actor in England was begging to get into Harry Potter. You know, um, so it got to the point as this movie was moving along that that everybody wanted to do it. Apparently, um, Tim Burton regular Johnny Depp uh, was originally earmarked for the reporter role that I believe went to uh, Michael J. Fox and I think Johnny Depp ended up turning it down. Was there any rumor of that? Um, I actually <laughs> auditioned for one of the reporters, one of the White House <laughs> I'd love to have seen um, that. No, it was funny because they, um, they, they were looking for someone and then I had a good friend in casting um, and I said, you know, I, I was a White House correspondent when I was in college, you know, and it was like, really? You know, I don't, I don't go around passing my resume around to people all the time. It was, I just sort of let, the, and Andrew can verify this, I'm sure. Yes. I just sort of let things sneak up, you know. If someone hasn't researched me ahead of time, it's like, oh, yeah, I did, I did all the Harry Potters. You did what? Yeah, I did all, all the Harry Potters. I did all the Batmans. I did all the Lethal Weapons. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, I did that. You know, <laughs> low key. Um, but I was a White House correspondent. Um, I even had a picture of me on the White House lawn, you know, um, doing my thing. And I gave it to them and they, um, they auditioned me. I, I didn't meet with uh, Vicki Thomas. I, I met with one of um, her associates. Um, I got the impression that they hadn't fully flushed out the script. And because they were asking me to improvise stuff. And, um, and I think they probably thought that I was going to come in there with some sort of insight about how the, you know, the reporters behaved in the, um, in the white house, but the, the cues I was getting were not, they weren't working for me. And we kept steering this thing in a different direction. We were making these smart ass remarks about the president's going to come. Um, talk in front of the um, to the people tonight on TV, or he's going to do a press conference. He's going to the president's going to do something, you know. And then there was this like banter in the in the room about uh, what it was all about, speculation about what it was about, and coming up with smart ass remarks. And um, I'm, you know, <laughs> not to be braggadocious, but I'm sort of a master of smart ass remarks, and. Um, <laughs> They didn't appreciate or like some of the stuff I came up with. Um, so I never got the part. And then um, they did cast the part with someone. Um, I'd have to look it up and see. I'm not sure it's even on IMDb because it got cut out. That part got completely cut from the film. Before we carry on, just out of curiosity, what president's tenure were you at a White House? Uh, Carter. Well? Carter. Carter. I was there. Um, Carter's first. Carter was inaugurated on January 20th. Uh, 1977. I was there March. Um, I was only there a week. Um, I was there March um, 77. So Carter hadn't been there very long. They were still sort of a honeymoon period with him. Oh, I, I actually um, covered the um, the arrival of the Prime Minister of England came while I was there. Um, James Callahan at the time. So I have pictures. I, um, sometime privately, I'll, I'll send you guys uh, photographs I took while I was there. Yeah, love to see it. Yeah, Jimmy Carter, the rock and roll president. Yeah. <laughs> House builder yeah. himself. Yeah. Uh, well, the movie was supposed to have 60 characters, which is a hell of a lot to fit in, but it was shrunk down considerably to around about 23. Is this right? It's possible. I'm, I'm, they talked about all kinds of people doing all kinds of different things because this, this movie goes everywhere. Mm. I mean, there's locations all over the place. You know, I had to think about, what it was Rod Steiger did, you know, cause I was looking at IMDb and it's like Rod Steiger. I don't remember Rod Steiger. And then I had to think about, and I didn't go watch the film, but I had to think about, Oh yeah, that's right. He was the general. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, well, even you get someone like uh, Danny DeVito and Danny DeVito got top billing 
and he's only in the movie for 1.5 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I think the I think the billing was alphabetical probably. Was it I was going to say was it contractual is it because he's Jack's boy and you know it was a, was uh, a no I don't you know I don't know I don't know. I don't think Jack had but Danny was on uh, was in Batman uh, Returns as well with Very with uh, with with Tim and everybody. So uh, no Danny's Danny's a very charming guy and a, and a very able producer himself. I mean, he ran Jersey Films for yeah. a long, long time, and and Danny is uh, quite quite the producer, quite the actor, quite he's quite a very very charming guy. I mean, you would fall in love with Danny. You should get Danny on this. I'd love Danny to. would do, would I'd give you a, to, yeah. a ten years worth of material. Give him a call, Will. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to get him on here because there's so many stories that we could ask. Um, oh yeah. But um, he wasn't the only huge name that was in there, and not all of them are actors, because you had Tom Jones ended up being cast in the movie. So how mm -hmm. did he end up being chosen? You know, was he the first choice, or were people like Wayne Newton thought of ahead of him, or what happened? No, I think it was, I, personally, I think it was sort of an afterthought. My understanding is that Tim had was in las vegas we everybody went to las vegas for the um for the implosion of the landmark um and at the time there's a story around that as well not specifically that but um you know we there was a building implosion in one of the lethal weapon films and mm -hmm. um they'd gone to florida to to shoot that and pretty soon joel silver was sending film crews to any big building around the country that was being imploded i'm not kidding okay <laughs> and because they thought they'd be able to fit it in somewhere with something so when the landmark was going to go everybody was interested i you know what i wouldn't be surprised we got the rights to it so we had our film crew there it was it was written into the you know into the movie and everything but i wouldn't be at all surprised if there weren't three or four other crews from hollywood that were just there shooting it guerrilla style just to have it you know I, I that would not surprise me so um but tim was there there were scouting locations in las vegas and tim saw um the show that that tom did and went back to the dressing room and and asked him if he would do the movie and tom did a decent job i wondered at the time why didn't do Wayne Newton? Because Wayne Newton was Mr. Las Vegas. Yeah. Mm. But uh, but we don't know if Wayne was even in town when they were shooting. He may not have been available. I mean, I, I I'm not part of those discussions, so I, I don't know. If um, if I was thinking clearly a couple of days ago when when Andrew first asked me about this, um, I might have called one of the casting people to ask because I'm I'm sure she would have remembered. And the important thing is. Tom Jones is actually the last person on screen at the very end of the movie. Oh, he is has he? All these animals around him and these birds yeah. on his arms, and then suddenly well, he, he just great doing too. But he was great too, and it, and it's so funny when he starts singing, and it's like, oh shit, you know. <laughs> so, oh yeah, boy, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently here. Um, they wanted to use the heat ray sound from War of the Worlds, but apparently Paramount kind of put a block on it because obviously they own the rights to War of the Worlds. Is this true? It could be. I don't know. They would have. Um, they they might have contacted Paramount to see if they had it in their sound library, and it may be that Paramount um, didn't have it anymore and didn't want to admit to it or whether they had designs on it for something mm -hmm. else. I mean, 99% of the time, the studios will cooperate with one another. But if they, if, but if there's something they have in mind, some sort of signature thing, they won't. Um, you know, everybody's very collegial about it. Um, so I don't, it, it could be that, um, that they just didn't have it anymore. It wasn't available. Or they didn't have a separate track, because I'm sure they could have pulled it off of a DVD of War of the Worlds and just used it, but they probably didn't have a clean version of that on a DVD. So what you want to do is you want to get one of the stems from the mixing session. And that movie had to be the early 60s, late 50s as well. My guess is they probably didn't have the stems or it would have been a sizable investment for them to go to the, the vaults. Um, they store that stuff in a salt mine in Kansas and a, um, a, a an old coal mine in Pennsylvania. So you, you separate your protection masters and you send half of it to one place and half to another place. So the IPs, the negative will not sit in the same place as the inner positives. 
um, because you need because of some catastrophe happens, you don't want everything to be lost. And Paramount at the time was recording. War of the Worlds was late fifties, right? Yes, I think it was. Okay, they were recording everything, even um, even on stage. When they were recording, they hadn't gone to Niagara's yet. They didn't start doing Niagara's until Jerry Lewis um, was introduced to the the guys in Sweden who invented that, and they and he saw a demonstration over in Europe, and he brought the Niagara's over told Paramount, you really need to do this. This is the, the future of recording production sound. And they said, well, you do it on your picture first, and then, um, and then we'll do it. But until then, they were recording directly onto optical tracks, on optical film, okay? So um, that, that inventory would be in one of those coal mines or, or salt mines somewhere. And it probably was going to be too much of an expense for them to go and retrieve it. So it's easier to just say, no, we have plans for that. Makes sense. Well, this was also, uh, which was a surprise to me when I looked, I had to go and actually double check this, but this was actually the last physical movie role of Michael J. Fox, who was obviously uh, starting to come down with his condition at the time. Uh, was this condition starting to appear throughout the movie? Was news getting out about it? Um, I was quite surprised to hear that he had that diagnosis of Parkinson's. And it was very sad because he's a really, really good guy. Um, one of the things that I was hoping to do, I, if I had gotten the part as the White House correspondent, I would have been working with Michael J. Fox. My wife loves Michael J. Fox. She would have been so excited that I was there working with him, you know, on screen with him with that. So um, I was really looking forward to it. And, and I had done Doc Hollywood with him a few years sooner, um, earlier than that. What a great movie. Um, yeah, it is. It really is. It's it's one of those movies that belongs in your, you know, um, your five in the box thing. Our younger listeners might recognize the movie as Cars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was a surprise to me when he um, had the diagnosis. And I didn't notice um, any deterioration in his health or anything. I didn't spend a whole lot of time on the set. I only went a few times. But I didn't notice anything. I, and I wouldn't. I didn't know him well enough to know. So I wouldn't have. And it was quite a surprise to me. And I'm sure it was a surprise to a lot of other people. He would have had to pass a physical. If he, I mean, if he had a bigger part in this movie, um, he would have had to go through a rigorous physical um, just to get production insurance. So um, it may have been – somebody may have known about it. I um, kind of doubt it because gossip travels quickly. It all depends really on what uh, what stage he was at at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Tim Burton has allegedly uh, stated that he got told that he could not kill off Jack Nicholson in any movie. But in Batman, he kills him off once. And in this, he kills him off twice. So do you know anything about this? No. You know, the only thing I can think is that there was probably a conversation. And I'm not saying this happened. And I'm not saying that there was some sort of thing that you can't kill off Jack Nicholson. I'm pretty sure it's in the script. Okay, I mean, I could go pick it up and leave through it, but we, I would waste too much time um, with you guys waiting for me. But um, I'm not aware of such an edict. Maybe somebody said, you know, in dailies, I'm guessing somebody might have said, um, you're killing off Jack Nicholson. You don't kill off Jack Nicholson. But, you know, when we did um, Executive Decision, we killed off... Steven Seagal before the end of the third reel. So, you know, and, and that became a thing in the, in the reviews of it. I remember Siskel and Ebert, they were really big movie reviewers here. They had a TV show in the U.S. and they were quite popular. A lot of people went to or stayed away from movies because of what they said. And they, and they weren't um, intellectually um, effete. You know, they were, they were down to earth, regular people. They weren't, you know, they didn't, they weren't pretentious. Um, but I remember when we did executive decision, I remember one of them saying, imagine being so confident in this movie that you kill off Steven Seagal, <laughs> you know, 20 minutes in. <laughs> so, um, if know. Steve's not seen that movie, he's got a support. He's no more surprises. <laughs> no, no, I have seen that film. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was the first film that, um, was directed by Stuart Baird. Yes, it wasn't Stuart Baird usually second unit director or first. AD. He was he was an editor. 
an editor. Basically an editor. I'm, I'm, um, and he still is. I mean, one of the premier editors um, in the business. And um, he wanted to direct, and, and he got a three-picture deal at Warner Brothers. That was the first. The second was U.S. Marshals, which was the sequel to The Fugitive, the Tommy Lee Jones mm -hmm. character. Um, and um, he never did a third um, for us. He went on to do um, – he went on as editor in, uh, um, for Malcolm Campbell in the James Bond series and stuff. Yeah, and I think he, he ended up directing one of the Star Trek movies. He was Star oh, Trek could Genesis. be, yeah. But he was the guy who – you called in to save Tango and Cash, is that right? Probably. He yeah. became the studio doctor. He was, um, they, the, Bob and Terry at the time went back to the old school method of hiring a, a, a really competent editor to be part of creative development. And they would look at the dailies every day. And, um, and Stuart was doing that. And then he hooked up with Donner on the uh, Lethal Weapon series. And then they brought in uh, Dee Dee Allen. And Dee Dee Allen was one of the most memorable, impressive, wonderful people I've ever worked with in the movie business. She was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, she left to go do a movie with, um, after he did L.A. Confidential, Curtis Hansen did Wonder Boys. Yes. And Dee Dee left. They hadn't renewed her contract. It wasn't that they weren't going to renew her contract, um, but they hadn't renewed it yet. And she went off and worked with Curtis Hansen. And then we got Frank Uriosti. And so during my tenure at Warner Brothers, we had three of the best film editors working for us with creative development. And, um, and what's amazing, one of the things I've noticed since I left the studio, Frank left before I did. The, there was a budget edict. There was an edict that came from Time Warner about everybody had to cut, every department had to cut budget by 10%. It would have been easy to just get rid of one of the stupid $100 million movies we were doing, but um, everybody had to cut down and, and creative development didn't want to let go of one of their own, one of the people that were homegrown. So they decided to get rid of Frank. And that was a huge mistake because when he left, we started having to do reshoots on just about every single movie after that. Um, whereas Frank would watch the dailies and then he would call the cutting room and Dee Dee would do this and Stuart would do it. And, and they would suggest cuts. They would say, where do you have additional coverage for this? This isn't really working well. I'm not seeing how this is supposed to fit together. And they had such stature in the business that they could actually go into a cutting room and sit with down with the director and say this stuff directly. You know, our creative execs were really loath to do that. They didn't want to, um, they didn't want to disaffect anybody or get on the wrong foot. Um, it, it, as creative directors, they were involved with story and things like that, but, and, and deals, but they weren't really nuts and bolts filmmakers. So they didn't really have the credentials, I think, to go in there and really do that. And I don't think any of them felt really confident, except for like Robinoff would do that. And um, Lorenzo would do that. And Billy Gerber might do that. You know, some of the guys at the very top echelon. Um, and Kevin McCormick even probably might have done that. But um, but if you had Frank Curiosity coming into you or Dee Dee Allen or Stuart Baird, three legendary people in the business coming in and saying, um, I think this is what you need to do. They listen. Well, speaking of um, someone who swung in to save the day, uh, Danny Elfman returned to work with Tim Burton uh, after their uh, kind of infamous falling out from The Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, which also ended up with the first time Danny Elfman didn't work with Tim Burton over Ed Wood. And uh, them now coming back together and, and reforming this infamous partnership that they have. Now, was this a studio request? Uh, no, you just, no. Oh, okay. This was the deal at the time. I don't know what happened on Nightmare Before Christmas. That was Disney. I don't know what happened on Ed Wood because that wasn't us either. Okay. Tim wanted Danny Elfman for this movie, but Danny Elfman was costing a million dollars, minimum a million dollars, just his fee for writing the score. And the studios were holding a line that a lot of, um, composers were raising their rates constantly throughout the um, the 90s so in the studio the studio all the studios they, they weren't colluding 
but there was this thing where nobody wanted to to crack the million dollar threshold. And that's what it was. It was um, Danny. Finally, D- Danny was the guy who did. And I don't know what movie it was on. This, but I, And I remember that John Barry, his relationship with the James Bond people totally soured on them not wanting to pay him what he thought he was due um, to continue doing that series. So you'll see he goes up to a, a, a point in those movies and then you never hear John Barry again. And, um, and he really took it personally. Um, and the, the Bond guys were really tough negotiators. So, but nobody wanted to crack that threshold. I think we were up to $800,000 for, for some of the A-list sort of um, composers and all that. So um, the studio did not want Danny Elfman because he was too expensive. They didn't want to, they just didn't think that um, the, the investment of the money was, was worth what they thought they were going to get. But Tim wanted Danny. Um, they hired another A-list composer, very, very well-known Oscar-winning composer to, to do this movie. And they, um, I don't know how much he wrote or didn't write, but they completely discarded um, what he was doing. They brought in Danny. Danny w- Wolf actually was the perfect person for this movie. I mean, it was Danny's sensibility, the way that Danny's music kind of drives a lot of Tim's stuff. This movie really needed that. It really did. And um, so I understand the studio's stance at the time. Um, totally get it. Um, but no, but that's not, that is not right at all. The, the, um, it wasn't the studio insisting. The studio would have preferred that Danny didn't do it because they didn't want to pay the price. Yeah, they ended up paying for two composers in the end because of the way they did it. Um, but, and I don't know what the relationship was, whether there was a strain in their relationship or whatever, but Tim wanted Danny from day one. You know, this movie really needed Danny Elfman's score. When you consider how the Martians moved across the landscape, you know, when you consider just even the opening logo with the spaceship that comes behind the Warner Brothers shield and everything, this, this, the the animation was crying out for something that would help it. And Danny Elfman's score did that. Lisa Marie, the way Lisa Marie moved through her scenes, you know. Um, and it's she was amazing, absolutely amazing. She never blinked her eyes. Um, and she sort of glided the way she moved. It was like she was on wheels. It was just amazing. And she was Tim's girlfriend at the time, I believe. Unforget Her presence in that movie is unforgettable. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right, though. It needed that wonderful kind of, I don't know, that strange otherworldliness that Danny Elfman's score has. And you can always tell the Danny Elfman score with just a tiny little fraction of it. And it, yeah, you're right. Because of the visuals, it really needed that kind of strangeness that uh, the yes. former Oingo Boingo uh, musician <laughs> brought to the party. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, the script, uh, from what we can gather, was much longer and also darker than what was released. Now, is there a ton of footage that is hiding out in one of those salt mines somewhere that could possibly ever get added back to it in like a HBO extended version or something similar? No, no. It's not that there's not footage, um, but you need to incorporate the uh, the Martians in it. And so you'd have to go back and recreate the visual effects. Um, and it would be way, way, way exp- too expensive to do that. I can't imagine a scenario in which um, anybody would do that. There's, there's been talk about this movie because it's um, the 25th anniversary. And even the Warner Brothers website, I noticed this morning, um, was celebrating the 25th anniversary of this film. Um, and, and it's been getting talked about online, you know, and in, in some entertainment uh, venue um, publications, but um, I can't imagine a scenario because it would just be cost prohibitive to do that. And you'd have to bring Tim back. You'd mm-hmm. have to get him on board. Tim would have to come back, uh, and we'd have to pay Danny Elfman another ton of money <laughs> to, to, to you know to, to do additional score, probably. You know, <laughs> and it would need it. What, what do you think? You know, what do you think you could add to this and not have some of Danny Elfman's music in there? You know, I just don't think that um, that Warner Media 
in their present state would ever um, put that kind of money up for it. It's, we are not living in the Bob Daly, Terry Simmel era anymore. Bob and Terry recognized that there were niche audiences out there and that needed to, that needed to be entertained and, and their needs needed to be addressed. And they would do that. So that's why we got Grumpy Old Men. And that's why we got Wrestling Ernest Hemingway. That's why Stanley Kubrick was, was, um, was allowed to do all the outlandish things that he did, you know, because they, they, they were particular niches that the studio felt um, addressed a need in the audience. And, and, and the other studios were not addressing those needs. So, but the Bob and Terry era is over. So this will not happen. But you can see the Martians in Space Jam 2, if you really do want to see them. Oh, yes, you can do, can you? <laughs> yes. So they have made another appearance in a Warner Brothers franchise, along with everything else Warner Brothers owns mm. in one movie. Yeah. God, yeah. yeah. It's funny because the other, the original Space Jam was, was being done at the same time as this. So I mentioned that I did Mars Attacks cruise, crew jacket. My crew jacket from both films are identical. They're the same weight. They're the same construction. They're the same materials. It's the same wool with the leather sleeves. Um, but Mars Attacks has a very subtle Mars Attacks on the um, on the left breast. It says Mars Attacks in their that red logo, and it says Film Crew underneath. And very subtle, you know. It's, it's nice, very very nicely done. Space Jam on the back. It, it's like having a back tattoo, you know, of, <laughs> of their logo. OK, and I was afraid to wear that jacket for the longest time because there were kids killing each other over shoes in the in the mid 1990s, around the time this God, thing was. Yes, being I made. remember yeah. that. There was a big thing, wasn't there? I was afraid that somebody would cut my throat and steal my my jacket from me, you know, and I and I my first thought, my first impulse was to give it away. But I didn't want to be responsible for somebody else's murder. And, and I'm not exaggerating, you know. So I kept that in the closet and I wore the Mars Attacks one. And, and, I, and more than one person came to me and said, why are you wearing that jacket? You had that really nice Space Jam one. And it's like, no, I can't wear that. I can't. I, I had to wait years before I wore that Space Jam jacket. And now it's practically worn out because I, I would wear it to sporting events and stuff. And, and, and I get comments every time I wear it, especially to a basketball game. I get comments on that jacket. And it's great. It's really great for some 30-year-old thing. You know, it's really, really great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kid would kill you for a Mars Attacks jacket. No. <laughs> well, that was the other thing, too. And I didn't want to be that impolite. But, yes, that, that definitely is something I said at the time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I do remember that. I think it was like, what was it, Jordan, the, the Air Max trainers? Yeah. They were oh, kind yeah. of like the big thing. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, God. absolutely. Yeah. Well, Mars Attacks was originally planned for a summer 1997 release, but apparently was moved up to December 1996. Now, is this true and why? Um, I don't think it's true. I, I don't have my notes like I did when we did Green Lantern. Um, I do have notes from the period, but they were, they're printed and they're in boxes in my um, garage. And I just didn't have the energy to go through all that stuff because I knew what would happen is I'd be calling up um, – junk haulers to come and take everything away, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, to, and, um, it, it, that's, that's a, a question I could have answered for you if I had the wherewithal about me to go, if I had the ambition really, and you've seen it, you've seen that garage. And yeah. so, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I, I, I don't believe so because um, one of the things about the green and the red was that it was a Christmas green and red are like Christmas holiday colors here in this country anyway. Yeah. And, um, and I, and that was one of the things they were saying at the time was that the green and the red because of Christmas. Cause I was thinking that it, it could have been true because Batman and Robin, which I believe don't mention that word. <laughs> I know. I know we shouldn't mention Batman and Robin, but Batman and Robin was a summer 97 uh, blockbuster. Uh, or intended to yes. be. And I believe Tim Burton was kind of an executive producer on those Batman films, although not directly involved with them. No, he was. I mean, he, he could have been, he might have had a, it's likely he had a, an executive producer credit because he had a hand in creating um, 
those characters, I mean, really creating the look and the feel and everything of the characters and all what, um, what Joel Schumacher brought to it was the homoerotic stuff, really, you know? Yeah. And then, um, they got more involved in, in visual outlandish visual effects, oh, you know, when we had our first meeting, well, not the first, but the first meeting I went to, the first sort of like pitch meeting and everything that I went to with Chris Nolan on uh, Batman Begins was I want to get away from this visual effects stuff. I don't want the over-reliance on visual effects. I want to shoot this like a James Bond movie. And everybody bought into that. Mm. <laughs> you know, people blame George Clooney for killing Batman. You know, that, that era of Batman. It wasn't George. It was Joel. And it was Arnold. Arnold took all the money. But that's a whole other discussion I don't want to get into. But that's, you know, that's where that failed. Did, that failed. You didn't freeze his assets? Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> See, there's always one more ice pun. <laughs> oh, I need to give you the cold shoulder for that one. No, I could go on and on about Batman, but... Uh... Yeah, I'm not going to. We uh, will at some point. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Love to explore Batman with you. We, we could go just... see the new one at three hours in length. Oh my god. Oh, I will be. <laughs> we get it, Bruce. Your parents are dead. Get over it. Um, well, Howard Stern, the uh, the number one shock jock in America at one point, uh, claimed that the movie had similarities from a work of his from years earlier, especially the use of Slim Whitman's iconic singing being used to kill the Martians. Now, was there any truth to this, and was there any fallout from it? I, you know, I don't know. It's I read that too. You know, I read mm -hmm. that when I was um, um, doing a little bit of research uh, for this conversation. I read that he said that too. Um, he did that for a local TV thing um, somewhere on the East Coast. Tim grew up in Burbank, probably um, wasn't exposed to whatever it was that Howard did. did. You know, it, it's possible. Anything is possible. Um, personally, I don't believe it. I don't buy it. But, but you never know. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not really in a position to dispute it one way or the other. I'm not aware that any claim was ever made, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm sure they would have welcomed Howard Stern to uh to be a part of all this if if that was true if he wanted to be part of it they might have i don't know about years later he did actually have tim burton on the show and actually played him uh the audio thing that he did on the east coast and uh, tim burton was kind of amazed and he just said wow you should have sued me <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, That's great. to be honest, I'm That's sure great. Kevin Smith was there like, hmm, yeah, yeah maybe I should have. <laughs> yeah. After the infamous Planet of the Apes fiasco. Oh, God, yeah. You yeah. remember that, Steve? Uh, yeah, I do remember that. I've, I've seen a, um, an audience with Kevin Smith, and they, he goes on a, one of his big, long rants about it all. And uh, he says at one point that... Uh, Tim Burton apparently had this quote saying, I would never read a comic book, particularly not one written by Kevin Smith. And Kevin Smith is just there going, you directed Batman. <laughs> no, he said uh, that kind of explains Batman. Then, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I don't know if, um, I don't know if what Tim said was true or not. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, you know, we don't hang out. <laughs> In speaking on your area of expertise here, Bill, uh, the budget for the movie was rounded out to around 80 million, with a further 20 million spent on marketing campaigns, and apparently the film made 101 million in box office totals. Is this true? Um, that's what's reported on IMDb and Box Office Mojo. In the US, though, it, it, um, it made maybe 30 million. The budget was um, between 80 and 90, I would say. Uh, it's you know what, and this is not the worst thing that. We, okay, you guys were talking much earlier when we started this conversation about some of the real box office bombs. Okay, I would take Mars Attacks any day of the week over The Postman. Okay, oh, okay, I was there yes. for both of them. I would take it any day of the week over yeah. The Postman. Okay, and The Postman spent a boatload of money. Okay, on stuff they had. Phil Rollins was their with their production executive, and um, and they they assigned that to him because he was the he was the cowboy. 
he was the guy who the expert on the horses and all the wagons and all the stuff that you know they ended up on horseback in that film. And he every day we'd be sitting in dailies, and he'd say, "This is never going to be in the movie. The movie's too long. It times out too long. This is never going to be in it." And um, eventually, um, the producers um, over at Tig had enough of Phil say, objecting to all the money they were spending, and they had him removed from from the film. You know, and um, and it's a terrible movie, just absolutely terrible movie. Uh, there's no other way to put it. I like Kevin. Kevin's a great guy. He's great to work with. Um, his in, entire team, all the people at TIG are just great. He's a great producer, you know, I, and I would work with them anytime. You know, I'll, I'll sound like WWE right now. I'll, I'll work with them anytime, anyplace. <laughs> <you know? laughs> or I can sound like an Irish traveler and say, anytime, I'll meet you anytime, anyplace. Well, I'll even fight your dead father, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, you know, it's like I, I, I will level criticism where I think it's due, but it doesn't. I don't do it maliciously at all, and and I don't have any animus for any of the people I've worked with, really. Um, you know, so, I can I can call them an asshole to their face and have dinner with them the same night. Yeah. You know, yeah. if if they want to sit with me, you know, it's like, and and that's usually the way it is with me. I I'm typically Irish that way. I get it all out of my system, and then it's over, and it's like, okay, well. Let's go for drinks, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I, this this movie is not the worst thing that I've even done at Warner Brothers. Not the worst thing by a long shot that Warner's has ever done, and it's and it's not the worst thing I've done. You know, Jonah, Jonah Hex. Hex. <laughs> Jonah Hex. <laughs> Which okay. we still need to go through with you at one point as oh, well. My yes. God, no. You know what? I would. Uh, I would. Um, <laughs> the whole interview would just be about two hours of you screaming, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, well, you know, the thing is that there were some, with the exception of one person who I really don't know, um, who I really lay, lay the blame towards on it, everybody involved in that were really seriously wanted to make a really, really good movie. But they had one person too many in the mix. Mm. And, um, and, I, and I have the greatest admiration for the, the people that the other people, all the other people involved in it. And, and when Jonah Hex was, was greenlit, it was supposed to be Neville Dean and Taylor doing it. And I get, and it was just like with Mars attacks, I was excited. I had seen crank, you know, I knew that I was explaining to other people what crank was about. And, uh, Ravi Mehta, who was the production exec on, um, on, Jonah Hex, he and I visited Neville Dean and Taylor on the set of Crank 2. You know, we, we went and we were all in and, and I was fascinated with how they wanted to do that movie. They had these really great ideas, really, really innovative ideas. And I just don't know how they ended up not being part of it. Mm. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure there's some inside story. Maybe Ravi knows the answer. Um, I, I, I don't. And um, and it was a great disappointment to me that they didn't do it because I was so looking forward to it. Um, I've heard stories about, you know, people pointing fingers at different people in the mix. And I don't know what's true and what's not true. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> yes. Ma Mars attacks. Yeah. Mars attacks. Yes. <laughs> Mars attacks. Yes. Mars attacks. You know, the film was much, much better received in Europe than the U.S. It did at least twice as much box office um, in Europe as it did in the U.S., um, I don't know ultimately what DVD sales were. I, it did come out. It was one of the early DVD things when, because hmm. we started releasing DVDs in 1997, and we were still releasing on VHS and Laserdisc at the time. I had the VHS. Yeah, ah. it, it, it came with a T-shirt. It was it was like in a double double tape box, a clamshell box, and uh, a green it, and red T-shirt. Yeah, for Christmas. Yes. Just like the green and red yeah. hat for no, Christmas. It, actually, it, it was a it was a red box, and I think it had a green T-shirt in it. I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I just did better in Europe than, and it wasn't really appreciated. I mean, I'm reading stuff about people are starting to appreciate it now. I'd I'd have to go back and look at it and kind of refresh myself. Um, I've been too busy 
to do it, you know, the last two days. But um, I'll I'll sit down and I'll watch it. I have it. Do you think that the the higher rate of success in Europe was down to more of a love for a darker sense of humor that we tend to have? Probably, and I think the cast, the, the cast are selling point. Um, I don't think they fully um, promoted the big cast in the U.S. The the poster art only featured like five people, I think. I'm sure it was Jack. I'm sure it was Glenn Close. Um, uh, Pierce Brosnan, I do remember being on the poster art. Um, I don't know. There were only five. They had the major artwork, and then there were five little boxes underneath. And, mm-hmm. I, and I do have the poster somewhere in my garage. Um, but I, I, And I know Pierce Brosnan was on it. I think um, I'm looking online. Okay, Annette Benning and Danny DeVito were the other two. You know, yeah. well, but you know, Natalie Portman was in it, and and Lucas Haas, and, and what was so funny is we went to the premiere. They had the premiere in Century City, in a in a theater that no longer exists. They've torn those buildings down, and now CAA resides there. Um, but they they had it in a big theater in Century City, the the Plit theaters at the time, and um, and a lot of the cast came. Not not. Not all of them. Like uh, Jack didn't come and Pierce didn't come. Um, I don't remember if Glenn Close came. I don't think Annette came. But I do remember Jim Brown was there because my wife was asking who's Jim Brown. And we, and we thought it was funny that the group of us from Warner Brothers that I was sitting with just thought it was funny that this movie had turned into a Jim Brown movie. <laughs> I mean, he was the guy that saves the day. And, and my wife is like, well, who's Jim Brown? And I said, well, he's... Um, he was like the original OJ. And then all of a sudden she's thinking, oh, did he kill his wife? Or, you know, <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> you know, and I said, well, not, not exactly. He's, um, you know, he was a big football star. He had all the records and stuff like that. He was, he was a lot more active in civil rights issues mm-hmm. than OJ ever was. Um, but, but there were rumors, and I, and I don't wish to tarnish his reputation or slander him. Um, but there were were rumors about him abusing his girlfriend or his wife or something like that, and, and I don't know whether it's true or not. You know, but he was he he was huge. He's in the National Football League Hall of Fame. He was huge in his day. He played. He was a running back for the uh, Cleveland Browns. Well, Rod Steiger has uh-huh. uh, told Premier Magazine that the movie's failure was because of it being shifted forward in the release schedule by the studio as a response to Independence Day. Now, you've already said that the the actual date wasn't being changed. Um, right. But was there a lot of pressure on Tim Burton to deliver faster cuts? And uh... No, no, I don't think so. I, I don't think they would have gotten into that kind of minutia. And, and it would have been... Dee Dee Allen at the time, and I don't think Dee Dee would have been telling um, Chris Levinson and Tim Burton how to cut that movie. She might have suggested to them to cover this or that, but it, but it, you know it didn't work on a lot of levels. And the movie the movie released when the visual effects were delivered. I mean that's usually how these movies go. They go right up to when the visual effects get delivered. And I can't believe for a minute it got pushed up because those those visual effects were involved and you don't speed those up you can you can throw as much money at them as you want but you're not really making them better well we've also got tbs uh purchasing the broadcasting rights while it's still on its theatrical run uh, is, is that true because that seems it's pos- it's possible but you have to understand that tbs is part of time Warner. ah <laughs> so that all makes sense <laughs> you know and i know that T- ted turner who um became vice chairman of Time Warner when, when the merger happened, when the Turner merger with uh, Warner Brothers happened. Um, and it may have actually happened later than this movie, um, but they may have been in discussions at the time. So that might have had something to do with it. Um, I don't think Time Warner and Turner merged um, before 1998. I'd have to look it up. It, it, certainly not in 1996. They were not merged. But the point I'm trying to make, it, it doesn't matter what the dates are, but Ted Turner was anxious to, um, to have his empire recognized as a network. It really wasn't. I mean, TNT and TBS are, um, they're, they're satellite things, okay? They're not networks. You don't, you don't tune into TNT because it's this 
collection of TV stations and stuff. It's one thing. It's one entity that happens to be up on a bird. That's what we call the satellite bird. It's up on the bird. Um, and the same thing with TBS. And Ted kept referring to it as a network. TNT means Turner Network Television. Um, it's not. But it, it's. I'm sorry, Ted, it's not. It's not a network. It's one thing that goes up on a satellite along with everybody else. And at least HBO has East West, HBO Family, HBO Signature. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, that's more of a network than, than TNT. TNT is, is one thing. Um, but it could be, it could be that, that Ted, they, it could be that they were in discussions for the merger. And it could also be that Ted was trying to get this first run film to go to him before we go to other outlets um regardless of its perceived quality or lack of quality hmm. it, it, it could be that he was trying to project the image of being a network hmm. i i don't know i'm just um thinking out loud funnily enough i i put this out there that they we're doing the show and we had a few people actually uh, message me uh, wanting to ask questions on it and it's been really favorably remembered uh, by a lot of people and I think it's one of those movies that time really is starting to be kind from it uh, for instance uh, we had somebody ask you know between the huge amount of cast and including even the people who are in smaller roles you had early roles of Jack Black Christina Applegate mm -hmm. uh, Paul Winfield was in there there was yeah. so many actors even just smaller smaller roles you know, they yeah. just show up for one scene. Who was probably the hardest actor to get out of all of that talent? Ah, that's a good question. I don't know. One of the things that all, that always drew me in on this project and made me, um, I never shied away from telling people that, you know, that it's not a great movie, but I always liked it. I always thought it was funny. And I'm glad I worked on it. I'm glad I'm associated with it. Um, but that was largely cast driven. You know, how many yeah. times do you get, I mean, I love the idea that I can go into IMDb and look up Paul Winfield and it says, you have one credit, you share one credit with him. I don't know if it's just one. I have a feeling I have more than one. Um, but, but it, I think it's great that I can look in there and one, and then I look, oh yeah, Mars Attacks. Oh, that's cool. You have one credit with Tom Jones. You know, <laughs> I have several credits with Jack Nicholson, but for a while I only had one, you know? Um, Glenn Close. It's, um, I love being associated with these people. And if I didn't, I would have had my name taken off of it. And there is one title on IMDb where I actually did have my name taken off because I didn't yes. want a cross reference. Okay. And I'm not going to say what it was because you know, what I know it was. It is, and there's yes. no reason, and there's no reason to, uh, you know, there's I'm no reason curious. to You'll bring to that person the into it. No, okay. You, you, well, I'll just have to I guess. Know. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, for you, Bill, I mean, how do you feel Mars Attacks holds up? Are you, do you think it's a, a kind of forgotten Warner classic or is, was it a missed opportunity? Uh, it's a missed opportunity, mostly, I would say, um, because it, it, it will never get its reputation back. It will never be known as, as a big success. So it, it's sort of hard to, um, to wipe the failure moniker off of it. But, you know, the people who admire... Tim Burton and the people who analyze all the stuff that he does and, and the people who recognize the references to other film works. Um, you know, but that stuff is lost on a, on a general audience, you know? So, um, so it's a missed opportunity because it, it, because the reach isn't as great as it might've been, you know, and the people who admire it, that's a small, that's a small niche. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that, that somebody likes it. I'm glad that there's that, that small audience, you know, but it's a missed opportunity because it's not a larger one. Mm -hmm. But it'll always be there. That, that's one of the great things about cinema. It's always going to be there now, you know? No chance of a remake then. You never know. Somebody <laughs> might do it. Uh, I think it'd be sufficient time. I don't think 25 And when we get, because we're going to get to out of the box soon. <laughs> okay <laughs> and uh, and i have something to say <laughs> uh -oh. oh god right well with that in mind then 
I think we should hop over and see exactly what Bill Daly's Nominate 5 is going to be. Now's the time to nominate 5. Nominate 5! Yes, nominate 5! Or 3, or 4, or 6, or 9. Now's the time to nominate 5. Now, I do love the fact that Bill is around the same age as John Ashton, but you'll play the bloody music to give Bill a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bill's used to it by now. We almost killed John Ashton the first time. <laughs> oh, really? No, the oh, thing is, you, no, you told me not to play the music for John. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's funny. That's yeah. funny. Then when that's you great. did do it on no, the no, next no, I one... Like, no, I like, I like having that music. That's cool. Yeah. So what's I've warmed up to it. Well, nominate five is usually the point in the show where we ask our guests to nominate their five favorite things. It depends on guest to guest. Um, but this time around, it sounds like Bill Daly has got his own nominate five that he wants to share with us. What? <laughs> he <laughs> does. Apparently. Well, here's the thing. Well, here's the thing. You know, Andrew told me, reminded me yesterday. Oh, and you're going to have to nominate five. And I'm like, oh, my God, I've already done that. How many times have I been on? How many fives do you think I have in me? Uh, so, so um, And then when we were waiting for you to come on today, I told Stephen that um, I'm really glad that Andrew talked me into this because I do have five that I want to put out there and talk about. The, the common thread in this is that these are all projects that are, that are being talked about now. I'm reading articles online about these projects okay so no, let me start no, you'll get it you'll get <laughs> okay. it number one okay number one is bullet steve oh, queen's God, yes. bullet directed by peter yates mm -hmm. okay they're talking about steven spielberg doing a remake of this yes i read that you today can't myself. replace steve mcqueen i mean for christ's sake you're going to replace steve mcqueen <laughs> okay Really? <laughs> so, um, so I had to put that in there. Go see the original. Don't. Yes. You know, at least if you're if they're going to talk about this, see the original and see why they're talking about this. Mm -hmm. It's a cool movie. It is a cool movie. Okay. Now, um, now Stephen, we know did um, a remake of West Side Story, and and it's very impressive. He did a great, great, great job. I don't know that the movie needed to be remade. You know. But what he did was great work on it. Okay. So I will give him that. And I suspect that if he does Bullet, he'll do a great job with that too. But see the original. See why this movie yeah. is so cool and why it has endured for more than 50 years. Because Steve McQueen is just the king of cool. Yeah. King of cool, that title figures into something else that I'm going to mention. So can I move oh, on to the second imagine. one? Mm, yes. Okay. The second one is the original 1974 taking of Pelham 123. Okay. Yes. Okay. Classic. There's an article right now in um, Crime Reads online, crimereads.com, um, about that movie and um, how timeless it is because, because except for the nerve center of the New York subway system, um, that's that those subway cars and everything are exactly the same today. After all this time, they still look the same. And, and because of that, there's this like timeless quality to it. But, um, but I kind of miss the gritty New York of the seventies. You know, yes. I, 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 know, I, I recognize fully that New York is way, way, it's never been better than it is today. Okay. Or at least pre pandemic, it's never been better. It's never been cleaner, safer, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But you've not been to Long Island City recently, have you? <laughs> Why would I go there? <laughs> Why would I step out of Manhattan? Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> if you want me to be a snob about it, why would I step out of Manhattan? <laughs> uh, so, um, I stayed in Long Island City. It was just a Howard Johnson's in the middle of a war zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but taking a Pelham one two three is. Um, so much better than the remake that was done with Denzel Washington and, oh, and, God, um, yeah. Yeah. and uh, John Travolta. Now, the original had Robert Shaw and it had Walter Matthau, Hector Elizondo. Um, Martin Balsam. Yeah, Martin Balsam. Uh, a, a number of character actors who've worked with Walter um, in other movies as well. 
you know. So it's um, Kenneth McMillan. Uh, it's it's amazing. It's just an amazingly well made movie. Joseph Sargent doesn't get enough credit. I mean, he's the guy who steered that, directed it, and nobody talks about him. You know. So so taking Pelham one two three the original absolutely go get get that it's on DVD it's on Vudu it's it's on Hulu Pro, no I don't know if it's on Hulu I know it's on Vudu and I know it's on um, I know it's on DVD okay the third one this is the perhaps I should have made this number two uh, because of King of Cool okay and that's the documentary Dean Martin King of Cool. That's, um, I've told Andrew about this. It's, it's, it should be running on Sky. Sky is, is, yeah. is one of the, okay. You got to see that. You know, I was involved in it. That's why I'm telling you to go see it. You got, it's really, really well done, you know, and I would be recommending it even if I wasn't involved. I actually am credited twice in it. <laughs> so, which is actually pretty cool when you're watching the end crawl to, uh, to see your name twice. Um, so what happened was I, I facilitated um, um, a very important interview for them and, um, and gave uh, Tom Donahue, the, um, the director and one of the producers, um, a lot of personal information. I, I, I said to him at one point, we were talking, you know, and I'm looking around and, and it's like, you know, I'm the only person in this room who met both Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Okay. <laughs> one that, you know, so... Um, you know, I, I I felt personally involved in it and all that. And then um, there was a there was something they needed um, towards the end, and they couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, so I started making phone calls to see if I could get it for them. And I was telling Tom places to call to see if they could get it. Nobody nobody had it, you know. And then I suddenly remembered, I may have that, <laughs> you know. And then and Andrew has seen the little video library in my in my spare room. You know, yeah. and right there on the shelf was uh, was exactly what they needed. So um, so I got credit for um, archival material and uh, special thanks for um, everything else. So Dean Martin, King of Cool. And Dean, you know, Dean and Steve McQueen, between the mm -hmm. two of them, that's all the cool there is in the world. Okay. There's, there's so much cool there that there isn't enough cool for anybody else. I know. I know. They beat, <laughs> they beat the shit out of Arnold's, Mr. Freeze. They are so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so okay so that's um, three so we got two okay, more for so, you so in line with um, so then the thread between uh, king of cool and the next thing is um the errand boy jerry lewis yes as a solo act um and i i bring that up for two reasons one was that it, it links in with the d martin thing but also um i recommended to andrew the last time i talked to him that that he should bring scott lewis um Jerry's son onto this thing. He could tell you all kinds of stuff. And um, sure. he's actually staying at my house this weekend. He's not here. He's in a different room. He's out of earshot. Um, but you, I think you guys would have a really, really good time um, talking to him. There's a movie that should really be looked at, you know, and I, and I personally um, feel close to this movie because um, not least of which is the fact that I've known the Lewis family for more than 50 years, but um um, he, he works in the mailroom at, at, you know, it's Paramount Studios, but with a different name. And, and I spent, I had a stint of a few months working in the mailroom at a studio here. So it's like, I totally get it. I get, where the, I get this character. I get where he's at and all that. Um, so, when, so the Aaron boy, 1960, um, produced, directed and starring Jerry Lewis. Mm -hmm. Um, I have his, his shooting script. I actually have it, um, it's about four feet away from me in my office right now. Wow. Um, parenthetically, I just I just turned my head and said, "Oh yeah, I've got his script right here." Yeah. Um, so the last of the uh, nominate five is a film that was nominated this year for the Irish Film and Television Academy Awards. Um, oh, the yes. final the final voting hasn't happened yet, um, and I'm a member of IFTA, and I'm really bent out of shape that I cannot vote on my own project because I worked on this project too. I helped, I helped with their delivery. I helped them finish this movie. Um, and that's Lyra. It's about Lyra McKee, the journalist in Northern Ireland who was killed by the IRA a couple of years ago. She was a friend of mine. So I'm personally and emotionally involved in this project. 
and um, and I want people to see it. Um, it's up for IFTA now. It, it, it only played at two festivals. Um, they're they're pushing to get some sort of a release, and we're hoping to get it into U.S. this year, so it'll be up for um, an Oscar next year. So that's that's my number one of the um, nominate five is Lyra. No, very good mention. I've we've spoken about this ever since the project kind of came up and your involvement in it. So, you know, I've I've been following your progress with it whenever you've kept me in the loop. And it, it truly is it does sound like an amazing documentary that needs to be checked out. Mm. There we have it. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Well that has been an amazing show. It really has. We've delved into some of the myths and legends surrounding uh mars attacks this iconic film and uh, hopefully for you listeners out there we've been able to clear some of the clouds away from it and been able to sort the the truth from the fiction as um, well as 20 other warner brothers movies yeah, as well as 20. <laughs> <laughs> i'll never look at batman thing. the same way um <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> we have to thank you bill every single time you come on you just give us so much great material to work with and so many cool stories so thank you very much for coming on and sharing your thoughts on i love to talk so you know it's my pleasure (laughs) (laughs) well out of all the questions that we've asked we've only got one more left what's in the box what's in the box what's in the box what's in the box Ah, Steve, yes, what's sir? in the box? Uh, at the moment, it's uh, a broken headset. Oh, you mean what is the <laughs> segment? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, what's in the box is the part of the show where Andy tries to tear me away from my Xbox and my broken Xbox headset and get me in front of some actual decent cinema for once. So he's going to pull out the name of a movie from a box and if I have seen it, then he's going to keep on pulling out titles until we find one that I haven't seen. And then I will go away and watch that the day before we record our next episode. This is very true. Yeah. So, as uh, you recall at the beginning of this week's episode, mm-hmm. uh, Steve watched the Ryan Reynolds movie, Definitely Maybe. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you want to know if he enjoyed it, go back and listen to the beginning of the show i guess so i have delved into the box and as usual i have taken out three just in case because we've never broken the three no we haven't i'd like to do that one day okay well let's start the movie can i have a drum roll uh no oh okay then well it probably won't even deserve one but the first film that i have pulled out of the box is oh hang on let me just check which year that is because there's two versions of it oh for god's sake i know i know ah you are watching adam shankman's hairspray from 2007 so oh you've got your first musical wow okay no i haven't seen that okay it's not the john what john walters yeah not the john walters walters Walters. not john walters walters Walters. what is walters Whatever. It's not that version from 1987. It is the 2007 version. Hey, it's another movie from 2007. We're doing well. Jesus, what is up with 2007? I have no idea. That was just like a magical nexus of Hollywood. Just there. Yeah. So, Bill, have you seen Hairspray? I I know I've seen one version of it. It may be John Waters' uh, version, but the one that... um... Was it Divine or John Travolta? Yeah. I saw the John Travolta version. Yeah. John Travolta... Queen Latifah, Michelle Pfeiffer, looking as, as beautiful as she always and, does. And which one was that? That's 2007. Mm-hmm. Ah, great. So, yes, uh, tune in next week when Steve will give his feedback on uh, Hairspray as well as all the other segments on our show. But for now, Bill, you know, it is always a fantastic pleasure. And I'm going to be with you uh, next week when this In episode, a couple of weeks, yeah. Yeah. But yes, uh, for now, uh, we shall see you next week. Yes. Take care of yourself and each other. Bye.
Butin. Never heard of her. 